In biological fluorescence microscopy, we commonly use two types of fluorophores, fluorescent proteins and small molecule fluorophores. You may also hear small molecule fluorophores referred to as organic dyes or synthetic fluorophores. Each type of fluorophore has advantages and disadvantages, and each works well in a particular set of applications. There are many things to learn about these fluorophores. Understanding and engineering them is an entire field of study. For now, we'll just scratch the surface to help you understand which fluorophores might work for your applications. Let's start with small molecule fluorophores. Here's a collection of different small molecule fluorophore structures. First, let's look at the similarities. Each fluorophore has a ring structure highlighted in color here. These aromatic rings have the conjugated double bond system that's required for fluorescence to occur. Beyond the rings, there are a huge variety of different molecular structures here. These structure variations lead to different spectra, brightness, and other properties. In order to use these fluorophores in biological applications, we need ways to target them to the biological components we care about. Some fluorophores already have an affinity for a particular biological structure or material. A common example is DAPI, which binds to DNA. Most of these fluorophores, however, require a labeling strategy to target them to a molecule of interest. This, the complexity and specificity of these methods varies. One of the most versatile strategies is immunofluorescence, which uses antibodies labeled with fluorophores. This is often done using a primary antibody to your target of interest and a secondary antibody that recognizes the primary antibody. The secondary antibody is labeled with a small molecule fluorophore. There are many other ways to label biological samples with fluorophores. Examples include conjugating fluorophores to biomolecules that have some specificity like phloidin, which binds to actin, and self-labeling labeling enzyme tags, for example, halo tags. And of course, there are many other strategies that we won't get into here. Now let's look at fluorescent proteins. Shown here are three different fluorescent protein structures. There's a lot less obvious variation in structure than we saw with the small molecule fluorophores. Each of the pictured fluorescent proteins has a different spectrum, but they all look quite similar in structure. Fluorescent proteins are composed of a beta barrel on the outside and a structure called a chromophore inside. If we look at the fluorescent protein end on, shown here in panel B, we can see the chromophore inside. The chromophore is the only part that actually fluoresces. The beta barrel keeps the chromophore in a controlled environment, which helps fluorescent proteins to work in a variety of biological and chemical environments. The spectral differences in these fluorescent proteins come from differences in the chromophore structures. Here are the chromophore structures for the pictured fluorescent proteins. The structures look a bit like the small molecule fluorophores we looked at earlier in that they have similar aromatic ring structures. The chromophores are formed when amino acids on the inside of the protein react with one another to form new bonds. This process is called maturation. Mutating the amino acids that react to form the chromophores results in different chromophore structures, which can change the spectrum and properties of the fluorescent protein. Fluorescent proteins are genetically encoded, which makes them ideal for use in live biological samples. There are two common ways of using fluorescent proteins. In the first method, the gene for the fluorescent protein is fused to a gene of interest, usually with a sequence that codes for a short flexible linker in between. Once translated, the fluorescent protein will be fused to the protein of interest via the linker. This method provides very specific labeling of the protein of interest. However, there's always a chance that the fused fluorescent protein could get in the way of your protein of interest's function, so it's important to validate that your fusion protein is still fully functional. Another method is to drive expression of the fluorescent protein using a promoter of interest. This method is often used to highlight specific populations of cells within an organism. Wherever the promoter is active, the fluorescent protein will be expressed. Let's now compare the two types of fluorophores. Small molecule dyes are often brighter than fluorescent proteins, although there are exceptions. Because they are produced exogenously, and most of them lack specificity for bi biomolecules of interest, they require labeling strategies like immunofluorescence. Depending on the labeling strategy you use, the specificity of the final labeling can vary. Some labeling strategies work in live specimens, but many don't. Fluorescent proteins, on the other hand, excel in live specimens since they're genetically encoded and therefore produced by the specimen itself. The level of specificity achieved by fusing a fluorescent protein to a protein of interest is very high. Fluorescent proteins can be tricky to use in fixed specimens. 
Some fixatives can damage the chromophore, leading to a decrease in fluorescence.